Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Coco and Dolphs. I'm not Dolphs. And I'm still not Coco. You don't have to make your voice like that every time. Uh, this is the way I talk all the time. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Could I have a Big Mac, please? <laughs> we didn't get any money for that. I didn't even know that he was going to say that. We do not necessarily endorse McDonald's. We don't, as a matter of fact, because they are greenhouse uh, contributors. Are, oh, well, yeah, probably, because killing all those cows, that like it takes a lot of water to get like one pound of beef. Well, and you got to cut down all the trees in the Amazon to get the cows yeah, to that's right. graze. Right? But, but this is not a podcast about the environment. This is a podcast about <laughs> oh, right. pop culture. <laughs> and, and what we're talking about today is something old and something new. Oh, look at you. I know. We did not rehearse that, which you would know if you listened to us at all <laughs> regularly. No rehearsals. Right. Um, so... We are talking about season two of American Crime Story, The Assassination of Johnny Versace, which was actually released a year ago in early 2018, but it finally came on Netflix, so we finally got around to watching it. And we're also going to be talking about a Netflix production, Abducted in Plain Sight, which was just recently released and has been all over my Facebook feed because everybody is watching it and kind of completely horrified by it. So (laughs) we thought it would be good to review both of those at the same time because they deal with a lot of the same themes. Well, and there is a crossover there, which we will discuss later on in this podcast. We're not going to give it all away right at the beginning. (laughs) Right, we're not whores. We're we're just going to tease you. (laughs) We're going to tantalize you (laughs) and get you coming back for more and more and more and sticking through to the end of this podcast. That's all right. So, so which one do you want to start with first, Coco? Uh, I, you pick. Gianni Versace. All right, let's do it. So the nine-episode series is based on the same idea of the O.J. Simpson dealio that was the first series, which was fantastic. Yes. And had many stars in it. Yes, and it deserved all the awards that it won. John Travolta was in it. (laughs) And his wigs. And (laughs) Cuba Gooding Jr. Sarah Paulson. I can't think of who else right off the top of my head. <laughs> oh, uh, the guy from the Birdcage, Nathan Lane. He Nathan played Lane. Ethley Bailey. Yes. But this is not about O.J. Simpson. Right. This Nor is, is about, it about the environment. No, this is about the assassination of Johnny Versace. Not as many stars in the Versace miniseries. Uh, Judith Light, better known as... What's her face from Who's the Boss? <laughs> Tony Danza's love interest. You had me there, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know what her name is. Uh, Darren Chris from Glee. He plays Andrew Kanan in The Killer. Yes, Penelope Cruz and Ricky Martin are probably the two biggest stars in this series, playing Versace's sister Donatella and his longtime companion Antonio. Gianni Versace, also a big star in this played by Edgar Ramirez. Yes. Who was fantastic. So my thoughts, this is nine episodes. It felt like 90 episodes. (laughs) It was not as compelling as the OJ series. It was not. It probably could have been half as long, and it would have been really good. Now, having said that, we watched all the way to the end. I had a lot of... uh, I was really looking forward to finding out what happened, even though I knew the story and everything Mm -hmm. like that. I wanted to see how they framed it, how they filmed it, how it ended up. Uh, at the end and so there was some tension at the end there's some suspense Mm -hmm. and by the way Darren Chris who plays Andrew Kanan was fantastic yeah fan freaking tastic I was very I didn't watch Glee Um, so he was on Glee yeah he was on Glee I did not watch (laughs) Glee I was very kind of skeptical that one of Ryan Murphy's Glee kids got cast in such a meaty role but he did a really fantastic job he and actually made me feel yes. <laughs> sorry yes. for him at times, even though you know he's a, a horrible. horrible person yeah. who is a multiple murderer, yep. who did all sorts of bad things, a compulsive liar, perhaps a sociopath. But he did manage to bring out glimpses of the humanity and like the broken child who just wants love and to be loved and to give love and... But then you still think, you're like, I can't believe I feel bad for this guy because he's a horrible person. So that's how good a job he did was that he made this guy be human. 
I felt that same way too. And I actually, uh, near the end where the, you know, I don't think I'm spoiling it because we know there's a manhunt and everything like that at the end. And, and we were criticizing his choices of not getting out of <laughs> Miami when he could have. It was almost like we were rooting for him to get out of it. It was like, what did yeah. you do? <laughs> right. Get in your car and drive away. Why didn't you immediately flee the scene of the murder of a worldwide famous person? Like, I, I don't understand. But it was pride before the fall. Oh, there you go. Is what it was. Yeah. But yeah, I uh, I loved Penelope Cruz as Donatella Versace. She mm-hmm. was great. She had uh, an accent and she had an affected, uh, almost like a lisp. Mm-hmm. You know, she had a bit of an accent and a lisp, and yet she and she had some sort of tooth thing going on there, but it wasn't <laughs> like a. a uh, the Bohemian the Rhapsody, Malick, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rami Malek in Bohemian <laughs> Rhapsody deal. You know, he was he was very good, or yeah, she was very good in it. And uh, I uh, I had nothing to, but good things to say about the acting in it. Right. It both the series have gotten stellar performances yeah. out of pretty much every single performer. The uh, yeah. the guy Finn Whitrock, I believe his name is, who played Jeff Trail. Right. He. He was actually in it for probably about half the series, like probably about four episodes. So it's not like he was a minor role per se. Well, he drives the story too. Yeah, he does drive the story, but he's. It ends up being yeah a, a big part of the story, but it's such a good like initially. So the story is actually told in reverse. Oh yes, we should chronology. We should talk um, about that. Yeah, it starts with the day Versace is murdered, and then it goes backwards. And it's basically a Kunan and character study. Versace yes. actually really doesn't figure that much yep. in the show. Like, it does... Okay, so I'll get back to Finn Whitrock, and then I'll make my point. Like, so when you first meet Finn Whitrock's character, you don't realize that he's going to end up being as big a character as he ends up being. But, like, the first episode, like, he was just kind of really heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. Um and yeah, so they end up getting fantastic performances out of even like the most minor characters. But um, so, what was I going to say about the reverse chronology? And well, I can I build off that okay, while you're right, thinking of it, it because yeah. where I was going with the reverse chronology as well, it's the whole memento thing. Yeah, uh-huh. but it's almost like it, it's it's a real gamble on the part of the writer who was Tom Rob Smith and the director who was Ryan Murphy, as you mentioned. It was a gamble. Because at the beginning, we don't really have any any sort of sympathy for these characters. Mm-hmm. We don't know them. Mm-hmm. These people are showing up. They're dying immediately. You know, it's like, well, what, how, what happened to he? How, who is he and why is he in this? But then as we go backward mm-hmm. in the story, you, you get to know these people more and more. And mm-hmm. you get, so actually at the end of the entire series, all nine episodes, you have the entire story of everybody. And then you, it's almost like in, that, in those last few minutes of the last episode everything pulls together and Mm -hmm. you're like oh i feel bad for that guy Mm -hmm. and i know more about this guy and that guy too and and, you know in andrew kunanan the same like we said it all pulls together and he's the last person that you feel bad for and that's at the very end of the movie whereas in certain parts of the movie or the series i should say you have oh i feel bad for the blonde kid because he was you know just trying to help and be a, mm-hmm. an aw shucks guy and had this great moment with his dad drinking coffee and stuff like that like and, and there's all these memories that they throw to mm-hmm. and so you feel a little bit for every every one of them but the reverse chronology really works but you got to stick with it yeah you the can't first, bail on the second episode yeah the first couple episodes like i really felt like the ground was kind of uneven because yeah. you don't know we went into it pretty much blind like i had forgotten <laughs> well we didn't watch it when it came, came out, out. and i, mean, I did yeah. yeah and i didn't really read any reviews of it like it didn't seem like it got as much momentum and as much like just press yep. as the oj series did despite the fact that on one, on one of our earlier podcasts we said we were really looking forward to Edgar Ramirez playing right. Gianni Versace, mm-hmm. and then we didn't watch it. Well, because we don't have cable, and then it was we only, cut the cord. And then it was only available on like FX Online, which we don't want to pay for, so we had to wait for it to come on Netflix that we pay for. So that's why we were getting around to reviewing it a solid year later. <laughs> <laughs> so my apologies. Um, and I remembered what I was going to say, but then I forgot it again because we started talking about something else again. <laughs> this is rehearsed, folks. This is totes rehearsed. But I, uh, 
I really thought it was a gamble, like I said, by the filmmakers to do it that way. I thought that there are a lot of people in the streaming world who probably bailed on this yeah, it's because only- they were like, yeah, so Versace's dead in the first episode, and there's the guy who kills him. But now where's Versace in the second episode? Right, and then now he disappears, and, and all of a sudden it's a new Andrew Cunanan, and is it all about the killer? And mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, it basically is. It's it is, basically yeah. how you get to the point of him snapping and killing five people that we're aware of. Well, and I, I also think that the Versace is the is sort of like the hook to get people in. Yeah, exactly. Because he's just an, one of the people, and not to diminish what happened, right. but he's just one of the people who was killed yeah. by Andrew Kanan. So it's actually very misleading in some ways. Yeah, totally. I mean, if... If he had just killed, like, five random people on a farm in Iowa, I mean, no offense, but nobody would care. Like, he had to kill a famous well, guy. people in Iowa would People care. in Iowa would care. People who are related to those five people on the farm would care. But that's, between this and OJ, that's kind of, like, the victims get lost yep. in the media sensation that ends up being the killer. Or the alleged killer, if you're OJ. Um, <laughs> like, what? <laughs> right, like the victims never get talked about. I mean, people know Nicole Simpson, people know Ron Goldman, people know Versace, but people really know OJ, yeah. and people know Andrew Cunanan. And okay, I finally remembered again what I was going to say. I won't interrupt. I really liked like the production values in terms of Versace didn't figure very large in the overall series, but there would be juxtapositions of where he was and where Cunanan was at the same time. Mm-hmm. So, like, there's a juxtaposition of in 1995 or whatever, he gives this interview to Out Magazine where he officially comes out and his longtime companion is officially recognized not as just his assistant, but that they're together. And they do this interview in this beautiful, like, five-star hotel, and there's every luxury, and they're both dressed in Versace, (laughs) and they're drinking champagne. And contrast that with Cunanan gets kicked out of his wealthy, older boyfriend's house, and he goes and he lives in this flea bag hotel in San Diego, and he's shooting up between his toes. And there was a lot of that. Yeah, there was a lot of juxtaposition of the high and the low. And I also liked that they did that with Kunanan's wardrobe, too. Like, when you would flash back to his salad days as a gigolo, he looks very much like... (laughs) Those are your salad days when you're a gigolo? I mean... Look who we're talking about, you know? <laughs> like, so when you flash back to his gigolo salad days, he's straight out of the preppy handbook. You know, yes, he's he in is. like the chino shorts and yeah. he's got the cable knit sweater tied over his shoulders and loafers without socks. And he's yeah. very of the very 90s. Yeah, very of the 80s, early 90s SoCal preppy look. Yeah. And then he's wandering around South Beach. You know, and he's sweaty, and he's wearing giant oversized T-shirts and baggy shorts, and he's got stubble, and he looks like Ben Affleck after a bender, and it's just... (laughs) So all those just juxtapositions, I thought the company did a really, really good job of. Yeah, I I liked a lot of the creativity about it. I I liked a lot of the, uh, like I said, the performances. I just think it could have been half as long, and it would have been... At one point, I said to you, this would be a really good movie, yeah. like a really good two-hour movie <laughs> mm-hmm. if they spliced it all together and, and did some cuts of scenes. Mm-hmm. Like there was a lot of deliberate – I didn't notice that in the in the OJ thing. The OJ uh, American Crime Story just seemed to – Yeah. it seemed to really barrel ahead. Mm-hmm. And you wanted to get to the next one. You want to get right. to the next one. And, and you're watching it and it's like all of a sudden it's over and then you have to watch the next one. Whereas mm-hmm. this one, it was like, meh, I guess, should we watch another one? Yeah, yeah we got to see what happens. Like, it, mm-hmm. it didn't seem to have that same pace, even though it was a very interesting and compelling and tension-filled kind mm-hmm. of story because you didn't you didn't know what was going to happen. The OJ story, you knew what was going to happen. Right. And you were compelled to watch it because of the style. This one, you were compelled to watch it, I think, because you didn't really remember what happened or, you know, mm-hmm. you weren't as aware of the story. That was, I said to you at one point, too, like, if you didn't really watch the news in the 90s, like, the Versace thing didn't really make a big impression. Yeah. Like, the OJ thing was on your TV every freaking day right. for two solid years. Like, yep. I didn't really watch a whole lot of TV then, but I know all about the OJ thing because it was just utterly inescapable. Yeah. You no matter who you were, no matter where you where you were, OJ is like the story of the 90s. Whereas the Versace thing, A, 
between when he was murdered and when Kunanan killed himself, it was only like eight days. Yep. So it just necessarily took up less of the you know news cycle yeah. than the OJ thing did. And yeah, I mean, everybody knows who killed Versace, but I don't know anything about his backstory. Right. You know, I mean, it just didn't dominate like the OJ thing did. So well, for me, a lot of the Versace series was new stuff. Like I knew he killed other people, but I didn't know what his relationship was with yes, the other people. Exactly. And I didn't know I didn't know that either. Yeah, much of his backstory in terms of his dad yeah. being an embezzler and fleeing the country. And I would be really interested actually in reading the book that the Versace series was based on. It's called Vulgar Favors. It's by Maureen Orth. Mm-hmm. Um, apparently the uh, Versace and Miglin families, Lee Miglin, who was one of Kunanan's victims, they have kind of come out and disavowed it and said, this is a complete work of fiction, but she was a writer at Vanity Fair when this was all going on. And apparently she interviewed 400 people for this book. So, I mean, we both used to be journalists. So I say, I'm willing to give the journalists the benefit of yeah. the doubt on, and yeah. I don't know how closely the Versace miniseries hues to the book like I'm sure some creative license was taken as always happens mm-hmm. in Hollywood adaptations what? but I know creative it's, license I know it's stunning but yeah so I would be really interested in reading the book to see what changes were made what things were left out because yeah I really don't know a whole lot about that that thing that happened you know so how long how many hours did we watch we watched probably nine and a half hours. Yeah. Ten uh-huh. hours maybe, nine episodes. Yeah. Do you think it would take you that long to read the book? <laughs> if you sat down and well, I don't know blazed long, through it? I don't know how long the book is. I'm sure it's not a breezy 50 pages. You know, I'm sure it's... <laughs> well, it's a Vanity Fair writer writing a book, so it's probably long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are you trying to say? <laughs> I read Vanity Fair in my day, and it's, it can be pretty long. So neither one of us is ever going to work at Vanity Fair if they get a hold Again. of this podcast, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so overall, thumbs up, thumbs down. Are you making a recommendation to our our very loyal listener? <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> to to watch this? Is it bingeable? I would I would give it a thumbs up. Would you? I, yeah. It's not as good as OJ, as we've said, mm-hmm. but I mean if OJ was just an A plus plus plus, like I'd give this a B. Yeah. That so. means pretty hard to top OJ. Yeah. Because it won many awards mm-hmm. and it's which doesn't necessarily connote no quality no although in this case it does in this case it was pretty accurate but uh but as i said earlier it was it was pretty compelling whereas this one was not so much there was more uh subtlety in this story mm-hmm. and there was more uh more message i'm mean, well maybe not i mean the message to me in this movie was about uh Gay rights and it was yeah. about equality and it was mm-hmm. about it was about a lot of that. But I guess you could say OJ was about domestic racial yeah. rights and domestic and, abuse, yeah, women's and, issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like so, there, there are big issues there too. I did read an interview with Ricky Martin when this came out a year ago, and he said that it was actually kind of difficult for him because he was closeted in the '90s, right? So playing this character who was closeted. To the world at large, like not to the core group of people who really mattered, but to the world at large. Like he said, it was very, very difficult for him to play this because it just took him in his mind right back to the 90s when, you know, people were trying to, you know, sell the world on him and, you know, J-Lo or whoever getting together, right? (laughs) So, yeah, so he said it was was very difficult for him, which – and he was uh, he was done dirty by the Versace family, like in a big way. Yeah, the uh, the will, Versace's will apparently gave him his choice of any house to live in and like a uh, like a stipend every month. But then Donatella was like, "Hey, guess what? The Versace board actually controls the houses. So yeah, take a week and uh, cry, and then and then you're out of here. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> I would be interested in reading more about that relationship, like." The Antonio Johnny relationship and why Donatella hated Antonio so much, and even though it's kind of alluded to, well, not even alluded to, it's basically said in the series she doesn't like him because they have like an open relationship, even though Versace doesn't want an open relationship, but he just kind of lets Antonio do what he wants, and you know, I would I would be interested in reading more about that. So there's some parts of the series where there are logical places to escape 
logical yes. places for mm-hmm. so the blonde guy who was seemed like he looked like Andrew McCarthy to me, young Andrew <laughs> McCarthy. He was really good in this, and there was many opportunities for him to escape. And Andrew Cannon goes in the elevator, and he comes back, and the blonde kid says, "Oh, come back later." You know, like so. There's all mm-hmm. these. Moments where you know what's going to happen. Right. You know, it's like, you got to run for your life, man. Mm-hmm. Get away from this crazy man. And yet, we come back. So, this is a segue, a very eloquent <laughs> and well orchestrated segue. Which, yeah. To Abducted in Plain Sight. Abducted in Plain Sight, which was the newer Netflix uh, binge that we did. Well, it was only a movie. So yeah, it was like an hour and a half. An hour and a half yeah. wasn't really a binge. Um, well, with my short attention span, that was probably a binge. Um, and so do you want to tell the li- uh, loyal listener, Coco, about the <laughs> plot? Because I think there's some funny things you could drop in on describing this plot. Oh, yeah. Okay. So um, so Abducted in Plain Sight is a documentary, actually, of a true crazy-ass story that happened in the 70s. A family moved in next door to another family in Idaho, and the dad of the new family is an undercover pedophile who takes an interest in the oldest daughter of the next door family and abducts her like two or three times. Uh, The first time he takes her to Mexico when she's 12, and then they end up coming back because... They got found by the FBI and brought back, <laughs> and then charges got dropped for various reasons that we can discuss. And then, yeah, he his hold on the oldest daughter is still there, and he ends up moving to Jackson Hole, and he buys, like, an amusement park. And the family lets her go to Jackson Hole to right. work at the amusement park, and it's just... So it's all one, kinds of cray. One of the this is one of those stories where you hear the description of it as you mentioned it to me when we were talking about it before we watched it, and as a parent, I'm like, what? <laughs> they let this guy take their daughter away, and then they let him do it again and yeah. then again. <laughs> yeah, and you know it was. And the mom inexplicably. So one of the reasons the charges got dropped after the first kidnapping incident were because. The guy is just a creep, and he had managed, before he kidnapped the daughter, to... He had, like, a hot and heavy makeout sesh with the mom, who they've been married for, like, 10, 15 years, and, you know, they're bored, whatever. And then after he makes out with the mom, but they don't have sex, then one day he picks up the dad at work because they're all friends and they're going out to lunch. But then he's telling the dad like, oh my God, I haven't had sex with my wife in so long. I just need some relief. And he talks the dad into giving him a handy in the car. And so when he gets brought back to the States after abducting the daughter, he basically extorts the parents and says, hey, if you proceed with these charges, I'm going to let the whole world know that... I got a handy from dad and I, you know, got to second base with mom. And so the parents are duly horrified at the thought of everybody so finding black this out. Involved. Yeah. And so they drop the charges. And so the, so this guy is a ma- uh, master manipulator. Yeah. And he's got the parents where he wants them. And then he just takes the daughter whenever he wants. And that's the thing, too, is that after the charges are dropped, they just kind of go back to. He comes over and yeah. they visits like, and they don't, sleepovers and yeah, nasty and stuff. It's crazy. And the daughter, because she's 12 years old, so obviously she's a child and she's in like a sheltered existence in Idaho. So you can't blame her for believing this at all. But she thinks because he's brainwashed her that... A- she's actually like half alien. half alien and she and this guy have to have a baby by the time she's 16 to like save the alien planet because it's going to be like alien Jesus or something like I don't know it's really weird but she totally buys into it and so that's why when he goes to Jackson Hole and she wants to go to Jackson Hole because she's like 15 and she has to have this baby with this guy but the parents never tell her no and the mom is a little cuckoo bananas because even after (laughs) all this happens with the daughter the mom still ends up having like a year-long affair with with the guy guy. who abducted the daughter i'm like 
And, What's and, going on? And it wouldn't be this terrible, horrible leap of uh, make a conclusion, leap to a conclusion that this guy has had sex with her daughter. Yeah, totally. Even though they made this big production about when they came back from Mexico, the daughter was examined by a doctor who was like, the hymen is still intact, which is just creepy. Like, I don't want anybody talking about my hymen. Like, that's, I don't care if I'm a 12-year-old. Like, no, you don't talk about my hymen. That's, uh uh So, so yeah, so the mom is, so this, this creepy dude has tagged three people in this family. He's gotten the dad, he's gotten the mom, and he's gotten the daughter. And the daughter actually seems the most well-adjusted. Yeah, she was pretty good. Out of all of them, like. So the yeah. documentary is very well done. Yeah. And it was horrifying in so many ways. <laughs> yes. But just, the story just tells itself. I mean, they just yeah. they interview all the, except for the uh, perpetrator. Yeah, because he's, 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 he's no longer with us. He's out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I would like to hear more from his brother. The, the documentarians interviewed his brother, and yeah. his brother is just like, yeah, he's a POS. Yeah. Like, I knew he was a pedophile. He is what he is. He shot himself. Like, pff, whatever. And the brother was, like, straight up. He seemed yeah. like he was a biker guy or something yeah, like that. T- and totally. he was not messing around no. with anybody. And he wasn't sugarcoating anything. No, he didn't sugarcoat anything. He didn't apologize for anything. And it all adds up to a really compelling and interesting documentary that mm-hmm. recommend, but... Be careful when you're watching it because it just is completely horrifying and it's stranger than any kind of story that anybody could make up. Well, and that's how we hadn't finished the Versace series when we watched Abducted in Plain Sight. And so we're watching Abducted in Plain Sight and I'm like, these two things go together so much because like you said, there were multiple chances for the blonde Andrew McCarthy to... Get out of there. To get out of there. Like, and I don't want people to feel as though we are victim blaming because we're not. Like, manipulators and sociopaths are very good at what they do. That's why they get people to do what they want them to do. And there was a thread in these two productions about the sociopath. Yeah, but you're like, at any point, if he had said, no, you can't stay at my place. I have plans this weekend. You didn't tell me you were coming. I, you know, we had a great time together back in the day in San Francisco, but. I'm good now. I hope. I wish you no ill. Mm-hmm. Have a wonderful life. Bye bye. Like, how would things have turned out differently? And it's the same with the parents. Like, I understand you don't want to believe that you live next door to a pedophile and that you've allowed a pedophile access to your family and to your young children. So I understand in the beginning giving the guy the benefit of the doubt. Like, okay, sure, you can take her horseback riding, have her back for dinner. But after he takes her to Mexico, right. cut him off. Shut it down. The FBI is telling you to cut him off. Yep. So don't... And the mom... Leave the FBI. Well, the, and we should also say, too, that this guy was married and had kids of his own. Right, yeah. So it's it's easier to disbelieve that he's a bad guy. He's uh-huh. got his own kids and he's a good dad, right. apparently, or mm-hmm. he appeared to be a good dad. Right. And but, they're also religious families. They're all Mormons. So maybe the religious aspect comes into it too, where they're like, well, he's a God-fearing man. He goes to church. Right. He's And more forgiving right. and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So it's, yeah, the, the, the mom is just still really cuckoo bananas. Like she, she still seems like if, she was kind of smiley in parts of it when she was talking, like talking yeah. about her love for this guy and yeah. everything like that, and remains one of the best times of my life. I think. She right, was, and I'm like, no, this guy banged your 12 year old daughter. Like, no, that's not a guy you should be infatuated with. 40 years later, lady, like, holy cow. Yeah. So, two stories, crazy people at the center. Mm-hmm. One's an hour and a half long. <laughs> The other is 10 hours long. The other is 10 hours long. <laughs> one's based in reality. One, like well, one they're is, both based in reality. Yeah, one, yeah, they're both based in reality. One's a fictitious, it's, it's a dramatic presentation. Mm-hmm. The other one is not so much. Yeah. Although there are dramatic recreations. <laughs> there are. You get you get them driving down the road in the motorhome. Like. And, the, and the fuzzy yeah. brown edge. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was wondering film, about that. Mm-hmm. Pretending that it was filmed in 1970. Eight or whatever it was. <laughs> no, it was before I was born. It was like 74 she got abducted, I think. So for another week, <laughs> we hope you enjoyed this podcast on very depressing topics. 
Yeah, we... Uh, We're going to do a Disney movie next. Dolph's actually didn't think that we should podcast on Abducted in Plain Sight because it's too much of a downer. Like, usually we talk about... Usually we have fun with these topics. Yeah, and instead we're talking about, like, narcissists and child abuse and quintuple homicide and... Well, you know, the truest uh, reflection of how good this podcast is will be how many downloads we get. (laughs) Speaking of, you can find us on iTunes and Spotify and Google Play Music. Listen, subscribe, leave us a review. Let us know what you would like to listen to in the future. If you want to hear us review anything, you can reach us at cocoanddaltz at gmail.com. Again, that is cocoanddaltz at gmail.com. You can also slide into our DMs on Facebook. We are Coco and Daltz. And share, share, share with your friends. Yes, yeah, Tell them about us. Sharing is caring. And uh, I'm getting the wrap the uh, podcast up from the studio, <laughs> from the glass, the engineers, <laughs> telling us to wrap it up. So, In our home studio with the Times Square crawl around the exactly. uh, dining room. That we will eventually get back up on the YouTube. Yeah, yeah, we got to figure out how to get the video off the camera <laughs> and into the computer. We don't know how to do that. <laughs> For another week, I'm not Coco. And I'm not Dalton.